You can start it. Yes. Hello, everybody. And hello, everybody, whoever is watching on the internet. Uh, I discovered something very unusual. Someone can tell me is that when the uh, the video monitor, when it's being recorded, it reverses the image in the recording. So it looks like instead of weird, it looks like Ryu. It's mirror. It's a mirror image. So can everybody say weird? Okay. So today we're going to look at one of the most weird, I hate to use the word weird, but it has been explained in the commentaries as weird, but yet wonderful scriptures in the Bible. Sometimes there are verses that seem so strange and you wonder why the Lord has those verses in the Bible. Well, this particular parsha, Shemot, has I think the one of the strangest and most bizarre set of scriptures in the whole Bible. And I'm going to give you my interpretation of what I think the verses mean after a lot of study, but it's just an idea. I'm not going to say 100%, so I did a pretty good job of studying these verses. So did you ever hear a message when the rabbi or the Pastor says, these are weird verses. These are strange verses. You never hear that before, but a lot of times you hear strange, bizarre, and weird after you hear the message. Because <laughs> you say, what in the world was that all about? So today, we're going to look at the phrase. I hope all. Well, I hope I downloaded the right the right image. Let me make sure I got everything here. The right file. Did. Chatan damim. Bloody bridegroom. Can you say chatan? Damim. Now the word chatan begins with the Hebrew letter chet, which is pronounced <laughs> What did <Mary> just do? <laughs> okay, can everybody do the sound? Okay, that's a very difficult sound if you're not used to it. <laughs> Only teenage boys know how to make that sound. <laughs> That's a teenage boy sound. Did your boys ever make that sound? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> so, can you imagine how do you, if if you're married here, if you're a married person, how do you think your husband would respond if you said, "You bloody." Bridegroom. What do you think? Not too positive. Are, we British? Are you British? Are you bloody bridegroom? <laughs> so here is a review is like Mr. Baker, who was an engineer and not a baker, explained to us that we see the beginning of the parsha that there was a pharaoh who was not aware of what what Yosef had done for the Egyptians. So Moses, something gets stirred up inside of him. He kills an Egyptian. Um, I think 
first attachment, I'm going to need to make the, the screen size small. So I want everybody to be able to see this. You can? Okay, so you can see that mostly, everybody? Okay. Because I had a couple of copyrights on there. So he flees to the wilderness of Midian. He meets Jethro, the priest of Midian. He marries Zipporah. They have two sons. He becomes a shepherd. We all know the story of how Moses, uh, the, the Pharaoh, had decreed that the, all the males needed to be killed at birth. Moses was put into the basket, and he was a basket case the rest of his life. Do, Natasha, you think that's the right size? You can resize that a little bit. Raised as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. So you see on the map where he goes from around the area of Ramses, maybe 20 days, and he goes to Midian, where Saudi Arabia is. And he's there for 40 years. And I would imagine that during those 40 years, he was looking more forward than he was backward. And he probably didn't think much about who his people were because it was a really hard to live in the desert. And I don't think that he ever expected to come back to Mitzrayim or Egypt because now he was 80. So the first encounter that we see in this parsha is that in the desert of Midian, oops, go back. And if you look all the way to your right, God speaks to him out of a flaming bush. So it's pretty far away. Moses was just out in the desert or in the wilderness. I don't think that he was expecting to have a vision or meet God. He was just shepherding his sheep. And then God speaks to him from a burning bush that was not consumed. And he says, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. And basically what happens is that God tells Moses that he's going to use him as a servant to go back to Egypt and bring the people out of the land. And that God would fulfill his promise to deliver his people from Egypt through Moses. So what did Moses say? I am not capable. I don't want this job. I am a stutterer. I don't speak very eloquently. There is a story in the Talmud that explains why Moshe was a stutterer. It's a nice story, and you should know it anyway, is that Pharaoh heard a prophecy that there would be a child that would take his place. And he thought that the child was motion. And so his magician said, we're going to test this child, and we're going to set before this child a plate. On one part of the plate, there'll be a burning coal. On the other part of the plate, there'll be a huge diamond. And if the child reaches for the diamond, kill him, because 
he's going to be the king. And what did Moshe do? It's just a nice story to know. When this happened, he reached for the coal, and like a baby will do, he took it to his mouth, and he burnt his tongue, and he burned his mouth, and that's why he was a stutterer. It's a nice story. That's the final Jeopardy question, by the way. So Moshe didn't want to, to go, and in the text, it tells us that God was angry with Moses because he had given him this great opportunity and he didn't want to go, but he reluctantly went. How many times have we all been given opportunities by the Lord and we say, no, no, no. Call Rabbi Yosef, he'll do it. <laughs> and we lose an opportunity. And God was angry with him, and he went ahead and decided to go anyway at God's prompting. So we're going to look at the, the text, and then we're going to explain it. So Moses packs up his wife, and they go on, they sit on a donkey puts his wife and his children on the donkey. And according to the, again, the sages, the donkey was the same donkey that the Messiah would use when he entered Jerusalem. So that would, would be a very old donkey. Also, there's just, just to know these kind of things so that when you speak with somebody, they can see that you're semi-intelligent is that according to some rabbis, they say that Moses' mother, Yocheved, was the same Yocheved that went down to Egypt with Jacob, which makes her like 197 years or something old when she had Moses. No wonder she wanted to put him in the basket. <laughs> Did you ever hear that, that story? So God had been angry with Moses, he goes reluctantly. He heads back with his wife and his children to Egypt. Now, here are some of the most peculiar, weird verses. And on the way at a place, it uses the Hebrew word malon, which means hotel, where they spent the night, the Lord met him and tried to kill him. That's exactly what it says. But Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin, though the text doesn't say which particular son, but it was, you'll have to decide, decide who were Moses' two sons. Eliezer and who else? Who was the first born? Someone tell me. You got to look it up in the Bible. So then she says, truly, notice, she takes the foreskin, she circumcises the child, and she takes the foreskin, bloody, and throws it on Moses' feet. How's that for a happy marriage? Truly you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, God, left Moses alone. And then she said again, a bridegroom of blood by circumcision. Now, I really didn't want to have to do the work that it took to figure out what this meant. But I decided you probably have never heard a message of this scripture yet. Don't say so. I want to be the first one. <laughs> Here are some really key ideas. And, you know, if I was writing the Bible... I wouldn't have included those verses because they really are strange. Now here's an underlying theme. Can you say prominent? All the ladies say prominent. We make it happen. Okay, ladies, 
I prominence. I make it happen. Look at all the women in Moses' life that made it happen for him. This is an underlying theme. You have Yocheved, his mother, who refused to obey the decrees of Pharaoh. Whether she was young or whether she was older, she decided to not bow down to the rules of an unjust government and an unjust king. And she had this baby boy. So here's Yochebed who was important. Then you had Pua and Shifra. These were the obstetricians. They were called, what are they called? What are they called? Midwives. Midwives. And so what did they do? They defied the decree of the king. And when a baby, the baby Moshe was born, what happened? Hebrew women have them before they get there. Yeah, the Hebrew women have them before they get there. In fact, since I'm teaching you a little bit of rabbinic midrash, some rabbis say that the Hebrew women had eight babies or so at a time. So, Kim, you could have just done it all in one shot. <laughs> <laughs> or a multiple, multiple, because they multiplied so fast. Yeah, here's the next woman in Moses' life, Miriam, the older sister who took care of her younger brother. And how many have been older sisters and you've had to take care of younger kids and some of the younger siblings were bratty? <laughs> you ever had to do that? So she, at the risk of her own life, what did she do? She oversaw the youth, or as they say in New Jersey, the youth of Moses. I mean of, Mo of Moshe. So you have Miriam. Look at this next one. And then you had Pharaoh's daughter. She was a little bit rebellious because... Her father had said, what? Kill all the male Hebrew babies. Kill Hebrew male babies. And she took the baby into her home and raised him as an Egyptian. Now, one thing that you have to deal with and imagine is that Moses didn't look like an Egyptian because people who were Semitic had different features, different skin tones. So here she is, and the Egyptians were racists. They believed in racial purity. You know that. And here was the daughter of the Pharaoh bringing in a foreigner into the household. So there was something about that baby that gripped her heart. And it wasn't the baby, it was the Spirit of God protecting Moses. And then there was Zipporah who was a Midianite and a Cushite. And I searched on the internet for about 40 minutes for a really good picture of what I thought she looked like. And she probably looked kind of like an Ethiopian. That's my best guess. What a, what a couple. 
In Zipporah, in her act of circumcising their son or sons, the text isn't really clear, preserved her husband's life. Even though she was, he was a foreigner, he was a hated Egyptian, and probably he was, since she knew that he was a mixture of Hebrew and Egyptian, there had to be a lot of love there. Because at that time, just to explain the culture, the Egyptians were purists. People did not marry outside their tribal or ethnic group. It was considered scandalous. Even in America, as early or as the in the 40s and the 50s, people pretty much stayed within their own people, so to speak. Is that true? And now you have somebody like Soledad O'Brien, who's a reporter. I think she's Korean, Chinese, Jamaican, uh, Anglo, Spanish, and Presbyterian. <laughs> And later on, if the trend continues, you'll see that there's, there's, not a, there's a lot of people marrying outside of what the particular boundaries were set over time. But in this time, there are all these cultural barriers. And later on in the book of Numbers, what do we see? Aaron and Miriam criticizing Moses for marrying somebody outside the group. But God used all these women. And though maybe some of the things that they did might seem trivial. Women have a very prominent role in the Bible, and we have a lot of people who are ungodly, who don't believe in the scriptures, who talk about how women are demeaned in the Bible. But I think that in the life of Moses, we see that women are elevated in the Bible because God needs both men and women. So, we see this idea of Brit Milah, which is called the covenant of circumcision, taking you a long way to get to look at what the scripture means. So, in Genesis 17.10, God tells Abraham, Avi, or Abraham, Abram, that from that point on, a sign of the covenant was the cutting off of the male foreskin on his reproductive organs. How's that for being very gentle? There's a lot of reasons why, but I don't really have the time to talk about the symbolism. And specifically, every male among you shall be circumcised. Everyone. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So what that is saying if a person is not circumcised, is a male, and if the person who is responsible for circumcising the person does not circumcise the person, they're going to be cut off. They're going to be, it's a play on words, they'll be cut. They'll be cut from the covenant. They'll be killed. It's worthy of death. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty strong. Obviously, in the sense of, in those times, since most people did not practice circumcision, if you wanted to find out if um, the male was a Hebrew, Israel, or Jewish or not, it was just a very simple test, if you know what I mean. That means, like, drop your pants. 
Do you know that, by the way, that in the first century prior to the coming of Yeshua, as Hellenism, the philosophy of Hellenism became important, some Jewish people decided to reject the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and subscribe to the philosophy of Plato and Socrates. And they had an operation, seriously, where they sewed the foreskin back on. Sounds funny. I want to illustrate this principle of why it's, it's so important, this idea of being circumcised. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. Now this passage is right before the Battle of Jericho. So you think about the importance. All the people that came out of that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. Now, can you imagine how could God have an army of people who were uncircumcised attack Jericho? And how could they win if they weren't part of the people of the covenant? The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years, and all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died. Why? Since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn, uh, oops, I'm missing the verse. The Lord had sworn to, missing a verse what happened fill in the verse verse 7 sorry technical difficulties not beyond my control I checked this before really you know where the book of Joshua is it's in the Bible for the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. And then we're going to continue. So he raised up their sons in their place. If God gives you an opportunity, right? And you say no, and you're disobedient, God is going to raise up somebody else in your place and the ones who God raised up in their, their place the sons they were the ones who were circumcised and that they remained in the camp until they were healed why because they had to get ready to march around Jericho How many days? Seven days. And then watch the walls come down and defeat the enemy. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach, or I've taken away your sinfulness. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day because the Hebrew indicates what the the four skins were like circular and they just kind of rolled away. See that interesting. So now we're gonna take the microscope and look at these verses. The question we have to ask why did Moses forget or wait to circumcise his son? 
Does anyone see, see that little cartoon? There's like two little chameleons sitting, looking at the ark. Dinosaurs. And they said, oh my, was that today? <laughs> was that today? Did you ever have God tell you to do something and you forgot? Write it down. No excuse. Oh my, was that today? There's a couple, um, there's two couples here today that are getting married, one in January the 17th and the other one at the end of February. You better not miss the ceremony and they'll say, oh, was that today? So in verse 19, God tells Moshe to go. Now, if you look at the language in verse 19, you could you can read up the slide, or you can let me explain it to you. Oops. This phrase is a, almost the same phrase as lech lecha, when God tells Abram to leave his father's country and go to a place that he would show him. And it can be translated... Go for your benefit. The benefit of being elevated spiritually. That's the undertone of the scripture. You look at all the scripture verses that are used like this. Go, leave your father's household. Jethro is his father, right? Take your family and go to this land that I'm going to show you. And it's Egypt. And... When God says go, usually go means I want you to go, I'm going to test you, I'm going to elevate you, and I'm going to prepare you to accomplish what I've called you to do. We also see this phrase go when God tells Abraham to offer up his son Isaac to go. And so... Both Moses and Abraham were told, go, and don't be surprised if along the way something that you don't expect is going to happen. Now, when God tells me to go, at least it's my experience, that I know to expect the unexpected. Yes? Yes? And even when I'm expecting the unexpected, I also always get surprised. He tells him to go. So he takes his sons, he takes his wife, and what does he do? He goes. Now, usually, when I go, when God tests me, I've never had an experience where God actually appeared to me and wanted to kill me. I have other people who wanted to kill me. Some may or may not be sitting in the congregation today. I don't know. But that's not what he expected. So he went, he's going back to Egypt. Because that's what he expects something's going to happen to him, I'd imagine. So why would, I don't know, I try to kill Moses for not circumcising his son? We just read it. Why? Because God told Abraham very specifically that every child... Every person who is a part of the covenant needs to be circumcised. And if it's your responsibility to circumcise that child, and you don't, you will be cut off. Now, even though Moses was sent, he hadn't been completely prepared. Because here's, I'd like you to read this last sentence that I wrote, next last paragraph. Before Moshe could carry out his divine commission, he first needed to prove himself faithful 
in his own household. So there's a lot of people that really can preach and that can really teach and really can tell you what to do and where to go. But they're not faithful. Say, preacher, Rabbi. Preacher, Rabbi. <laughs> they're not faithful in their own household. They have a public image, but the image of God is not within. And so Moses, he's on his way. He's got his staff, you know, that powerful staff. And there's lots of reasons that the commentators say why Moses did not. Some say that the youngest son had just been born and he thought it would be dangerous. Other people say that Moses was just forgetful. But if God gives a command and he says, this is what you need to do or you suffer the consequences, it doesn't whether, matter whether you're Moses or you're me. You have to obey what the Lord says. Now here's where Zipporah steps in. Eliezer. The text doesn't say what child, but some people think it was Eliezer. So incapacitated from God's attack. So apparently it wasn't a dream. It wasn't a vision. She saw what she perceived to be God. Some rabbinic commentators say it was Satan. The Bible says, it says God. Attack him. And because she loves her husband, now here's where she could have, she, if she didn't love her husband, she could have said, you know, I've been trying to get rid of him for a long time. So, okay. Right? Later on, you see they get divorced. Zipporah so chooses to perform the task of Greek Milah on her husband's behalf. She was his redeemer. Isn't that very interesting? That God raised her up, which was a reaffirmation of her love for him in an act of redemption. There's more. So he, meaning let him go, and then she said, a bloody husband you are because of circumcision. Now, here's the problem. What in the world does the phrase bridegroom of blood mean? Here is the key. You have a mixture of related languages with words that have similar meanings. So you have Proto-Hebrew. Hebrew didn't exactly exist, but a form of Hebrew existed. You have Proto-Arabic, form of Arabic that existed, not the Arabic that we necessarily speak today. You had Midianite. You had the Akkadian language. You had the Egyptian language. And when I did an extensive study of the word Khatan, depending on what language was used, the meaning is different. Now, the first language of Zipporah was Midian, was Midianite. The first language of Moses was probably Egyptian. And then he spoke Ketzat Ivrit. He spoke a little bit of Hebrew, whatever the Hebrew was at that time. And obviously he learned how to speak Midian. And he knew how to speak sheep, you know, because he had to speak to his sheep. Baba. That was a very bad joke. Who said terrible? <laughs> Thank you very much. So, again, the issue of translation. Like an Arabic word, a Hebrew or an Aramaic word, there's like a range of meanings. 
depending on the context. So that's the problem. Words have different meaning in different countries. Sometimes there's a mixture of languages. Like, for example, when you're with a group of people and you're in Israel, you could say, Kadima, let's move forward. But most people say, Yala. Yala is move forward in Arabic. You can have a Chaver, a brother, or some people say, Habibi. And then in some countries, for example, in Israel, there's a word for babysitter, which is mitapelet. But most people say babysitter. <laughs> and look, I need to have babysitter. Coca Cola is Coca Cola. Pizza is pizza. Okay is okay. I think, for example, in Spanish and lots of countries, cornflakes means every kind of cereal that there is. Oh, no. I want some cornflakes. <laughs> or, this is one of my favorite ones, in America, in America, America, if you are congested, you go to the store and you put on Vicks Vapo Rub. Yes, everybody know that? Vicks Vapo Rub. And not in South America or Central America. You put on Big Bapa Room. <laughs> Big Bapa Room. <laughs> Big Bapa Room. Oh, Vix Vapor. In Mexico, you can eat tacos or you can wear tacos. Because that can mean like shoes. <laughs> so lots of languages. There's a problem of translation, and there's all kinds of different. There's all kinds of um, words, like expressions like chevere. How do you chevere? Well, how do you translate that? Or like they say in some country, K Chimbo. That's what I'm saying. You don't say that word, but what does it mean? Some guy doesn't know what it means. Okay. That's from Venezuela. And finally, Chevrolet Cambur Banana. So, the word Khatan is a word that's a fossil. Nobody knows what it means. But the word is a, it's a word about relationship. A social relationship rather than a blood relative. And so since Zipporah uses this term, it's probably a Midianite term. Come on. In Hebrew, the word circumcision and marriage are tied together in ancient Hebrew. The word can also mean son-in-law, bridegroom, or one who is circumcised. So, the phrase can also mean to be related by the blood of circumcision. Next. In Arabic, the word means to protect. So with that mixture of languages in the time of this story, the word meant bridegroom, son-in-law, protector, blood relationship, and the one who circumcises. So let's see if we're going to get there. And by circumcising her son, Zipporah was assured that Adonai would protect and preserve her relationship with Moshe and with her family. Next, smearing the blood. 
there's a very another interesting point. So I'll try to go fast. Is that in commentaries in the Bible, rabbinic commentaries in particular, you see that at the time of the Exodus, when the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost, it is also interpreted that the blood of the newly circumcised was mixed in with the blood of the lamb and put on the doorpost to protect the people from the death angel. And there was a joining of the idea of the blood of the circumcision being a type of blood redemption, foreshadowing the blood of the lamb and foreshadowing the circumcision of our hearts. So Zipporah took a flint and cut her son's foreskin and dabbed Vat Taga, which is used in Exodus 12, his legs with it. And it's the same verb used in the Passover narrative. So what basically happened? God saw the blood. She put the blood, the blood of the circumcision, which foreshadowed the blood of the lamb, on the legs of Moses. And when God saw the blood, what did he do? He passed over Moshe and preserved his life. And this is what all these midrashes you can look are given to some other time. So here's some things that this verse can say. I am restoring you to life by means of our son's blood. How's that for being prophetic? Our son's blood restored you to life. Zipporah is making a sign of protection similar to the sign on the doorpost. Why? Because if the sons were going to leave Egypt, no uncircumcised person could eat of the Passover. They needed to be circumcised. Not only because of what God as a sign of the covenant, but they couldn't eat the Passover. So it was essential that Gershom and Eliezer be circumcised to be part of the covenant and to be able to take care of the Passover. Long time. The Lord left him alone because through the blood he passed from death to life. And as believers, through the blood, we pass from death to life. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved their lives, not unto death. So here's the question. As believers, what is it that God has clearly instructed you to do, but it still remains undone? I would say most people have at least one major thing. And when are you going to move forward or do you want to get to the place that you've neglected it so long that God raises someone else up in your place, effectively killing them, metaphorically? Because he said, I raised you up. And just like Mordechai said to Esther, if you don't do your duty, I'm paraphrasing, I'm good, God will raise up another person, and don't think that you, out of all the Jews, will be spared. If God would not spare Esther from stepping forward to speak on behalf of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, why do you think God will spare you if you don't step forth and speak when it's time to speak. That's a pretty serious 
statement, isn't it? It's not to be condemning. It's meant to help you leave the wilderness and return or go to the place that God has prepared for you to stand before kings or just the common person. But it's time to obey, and we're in this new civil pagan New Year. Someone said it, you know. It's time not to act like a pagan. It's time to step forth as a believer. Let's pray. I always like you to pray after me because I'm praying, we're all praying together. I thank you, Lord God, that in Yeshua, I can break through a wall and jump over a mountain. That you have equipped me with the weapons of my of warfare that are not carnal, but they are spiritual to the tearing down of not only my strongholds, but strongholds. With the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the shoes of the good news, the breastplate of righteousness, and the buckle of salvation. I thank you that I am well equipped And I thank you, Lord God, that I am well empowered because even if I'm weak, I am strong. And I am an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And I don't love my life unto death. I thank you, Lord God, that just as Moses' life was preserved by the shedding of blood, that my life has been preserved by the shedding of blood. And I acknowledge and I am thankful for all the females that you have sent into my life to help shape me and form me and nurture me and make me the person that I am today. Thank you so much for doing all these things and even more in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, before we close, let's see if we can sing this song again. That's the song. I can get the video to work. And then we're going to have the... Um, Blessing over. Let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, because this is one of my favorite songs. I don't want to use it too much, but we will. Okay. No, maybe they can hear it. Well, this is an ad. I'm not selling anything. Ready? We'll make it smaller. Oops. Oh, I'm be close.